of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' day. Silent as He stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, He took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross! My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor unto me. Saints of heaven. To purchase and redeem And reconcile the very one Who nailed him to that train Oh, that love it was my salvation Lay your love Jesus built now the curse of sin has no hold on me whom the Son sets free always oh, free now my
Church, what an incredible day to reflect on and just to remember all that Jesus accomplished on the cross for you and I. And today, like no other day, we remember Jesus on that cross. God displaying His love for all mankind. In fact, there's never been another time in the human history where God displayed such great love for all mankind. You see, it was out of God's love for you and I that Jesus went to the cross. And when you think of the word love, This is what we know is that love wants the best for someone. And you know, God wants the best for you and I. And that's why He sent Jesus, His Son, to die on the cross. Because life outside of Jesus is not the best life. Sin holds us back. All of our past errors and mistakes, that's not what God calls us to live in. And so God sent His Son because He wants the best for you and I. And then love believes the best. You see, Jesus came to this earth because God believes in you and I. He created you and I. And because He believes in us, Jesus went to the cross. And thirdly, love, love gives the best. You see, Jesus coming down was not just any person. It was the Son of God. Heaven's best. God invested His Son, Jesus, and caused Him to go to the cross and die for you and I so that we could have the best life here on this earth and we could experience eternal life and so today as we get ready to give I don't think there's a greater opportunity for each and every one of us above our tithes and above our normal giving that we can show appreciation to God and believe in all that God has done for us through His Son Jesus and so today as we give we give out of our love for God because He first loved us. We give because we appreciate the magnitude of what Jesus accomplished, that now we have an unconditional love. Now we are forgiven of our sins. Now we have freedom and we're not no longer slaves to the life that we used to live. And most of all, we have eternal life, something that money could never buy. And so we give not to earn anything, but we give because we love God and are grateful and show appreciation to the greatest sacrifice in human history. God sending His Son, Jesus. Today, as we get ready to give, there's different options. It's going to come up on your screen right where you are. You can participate in the giving today. And I want to pray as we get ready to give today. Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who gave His life for each and every one of us. God, I pray for every person today giving, Lord. God, we give to you because we love you. We give to you because we appreciate everything that you have done, Lord. So God, I pray that you'd bless every person, increase them, protect them, and provide for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, what a special day. The day that Jesus hung on the cross for you and I. And now we can come to the table of the Lord and take communion on this Easter Friday. You know, the cross speaks of many things. It speaks of forgiveness. It speaks of salvation, God's healing power. It speaks of God's love for you and I. You know, when you look at the cross, the cross consists of two beams, one vertical beam and one horizontal beam. The horizontal beam represents you and I. It represents humanity, our faults and our failures. And the vertical beam represents God's salvation plan. You know, the horizontal beam is like a dash. It's the same symbol used as a minus sign. And that is what our life is like without God. It's a negative. We were born with a minus, with a deficit, a void, all because sin has destroyed our lives. And God sent His Son, Jesus. And when Jesus was lifted up on that vertical beam, that vertical beam was raised, which crossed through our minus, our negative. And the vertical of the cross turned our minus into a plus. You know, the Romans thought that the cross was just an instrument for crucifixion, but it was God's plus sign for man's minus-minded thinking. And Jesus turns loss into gain, lack into abundance, sickness into healing, loneliness into relationship. And today as we take the bread, we remember how Jesus on that cross adds to your life, adds to our life. And our life is complete because of the story of Jesus hanging on the cross and bringing salvation to us. And so today as we take communion, 
we accept Jesus. You see, taking communion is identifying that Jesus is our Savior. And on the night that Jesus, before He was betrayed and went to the cross, said, whenever we take the bread, we eat it in remembrance of Him. And so let's take the bread together right where you are, in your home, with your families. Let's do this together as the body of Christ, as we identify Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let's take the cup. You know, the cup speaks about the blood of Jesus that forgives us of all of our sins. Let's take together and drink. church and welcome to Imagine Church this Easter Friday. You know, this is the day that sets us apart as Christ followers, the day that we remember what Jesus did so that if we choose him, we could have eternal life. You know, today we've just taken communion and upon taking communion, we're reflecting on all that God accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ, for each and every one of us. And through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we have been accepted by God and can experience His love for each and every one of us. If you're joining us for the first time or are new to Imagine Church, we want to welcome you. If you'd like to get to know us better, then please visit our website or download our app. And if you let us know that you're new to our church by following the links on the screen, someone will connect with you during the week. The greatest story of all time is the Easter story. 
And so we've prepared an exciting message for you that you can lean in and listen to. And I hope that as you open up your heart, you reflect on this day that took place 2,000 years ago where Jesus died for the sins of mankind, that you would receive God's word, you'd receive his love. So open up your hearts, lean into the message, and I hope you enjoy it. Church, as we celebrate Easter this year, we approach this day with such a sense of gratitude and thankfulness because of the significance of this day. You know, today is a defining day in Christianity. Easter Friday is the first part of a promise fulfilled for all mankind. You know, every year as we celebrate Easter, we like to create a theme or a thought around the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as I was thinking about this year's Easter theme, I was thinking about all the uncertainty and the inconsistency which is all around us and in our world today. And noticing that we're living in a time and space where there is very little stability. There's no real guarantee for people to hold on to. The future is unknown. And we're living in unpredictable times. And as a result, we can feel unsettled, unsure, fearful, and insecure because there is no guarantee. And then I was thinking about the nature and the character of God, which is unchanging and the, unfa- and the faithfulness of God and the consistency of God towards you and I and towards mankind through all the generations. You know, from the beginning of time, all through the millennia, God has done what He said He would do in His Word. God has kept His promises. And this Easter, we celebrate Easter as the promise. That God made a promise and He fulfilled it. Because right from the start of creation to this day, God has kept His promise. I don't know about you, but in today's world, the promise doesn't carry the same weight or same kind of emphasis or guarantee that it possibly did 20 or 30 years ago. Today, people make promises to each other, but don't always fulfill them. Businesses make promises which they don't deliver on. Governments make promises to win people over. But when God makes a promise, His promises are true. His promises can be trusted. The words of His promises are connected to who He is. And because God is truth, His promises are true. You know, the definition of a promise is simply this. It's a declaration or assurance that one will do something or that a particular thing will happen. I don't know what your experiences are when you hear the word promise. I don't know what comes to mind. For some of us, we might have been let down or hurt because a promise which was made was not fulfilled. And as a result, you view promises as cheap statements. Or maybe you have a high value on promises because those who have promised to do something or make something happen for you have kept their promises. But the truth is the validation or the guarantee of a promise involves two things. What has been declared and who is making the promise. You see, that's why I like to call Easter the great promise because God is the one who made a promise to do something and make something happen that no one else could make happen. From the beginning of Genesis right up to this present day, every promise God has made, He has made come to pass. In Genesis chapter 126, it says, God made mankind in His likeness and in His image. God created Adam and Eve, and they lived in peace with God. They lived in the blessing of God. They lived in freedom and walked in perfect healing and the abundance of all God had. They experienced everything God said they would. And it was in the Garden of Eden that the fall of man happened and sin entered into our world. In Genesis chapter 3, the devil came along to break and destroy the relationship between God and man, allowing sin to enter into the human heart, causing fear to settle into humanity's heart, and peace would be replaced with worry. Sickness would now be born in the body and of mankind, and the abundance of God and the blessing of God would be limited. And because sin entered the world and the heart of man, man was separated from God. And as a result, we toiled the ground by the sweat of our bra and suffered severely under the consequence of our sin. The first family in the world and every family thereafter has experienced hardship, pain, and suffering. Where one brother covets another, where anger becomes the part of the sinful nature. Cain killing his brother Abel. But in the midst of all of this pain and suffering and destruction, God promises to fix the problem. He promises to fix the problem of sin and take 
care of the devil and restore what was stolen. Look what goes on in Genesis chapter 3. God says this. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Look what it says now. This is all about Jesus. It says that he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right in the beginning of creation, God promised when sin entered this world to send us a Savior. He promised that He would restore what was stolen, that which sin has taken away. You see, the promise is that God would send Jesus and Jesus would crush the devil and every evil force which tries to deceive and destroy mankind. And there are over 300 prophecies in the Bible that a Savior would come. 316 promises from God about Jesus and all that Jesus would accomplish and the Savior would fulfill for our lives. And as you read through Scripture, in every era and every age where God has rescued His people through a mighty act or an individual, it has always pointed to Jesus. From the time of Abraham to all the prophets, judges and kings, a Savior was promised. And God has kept every promise of salvation made to Abraham and to you and me. Abraham was promised that he would become a great nation, and he did. And God said to him, I will make you into a great nation, and there will be a time that this great nation of yours will, and their descendants will be in captivity for 430 years. In captivity, they would be oppressed. They will be slaves. They would be held captives by their taskmasters. And then God says, but even though that happens, I will deliver them so that they can worship me. And I will lead them and I will take them to a land of their own. You see, the promise was to be set free from Egypt, travel through the wilderness and inherit the promised land. And on the 430th year, God honored His promise and delivered Israel out of Egypt just as He said He would. You see, this story is more than just a story. It's a picture of our lives. You see, because Egypt represents our lives in this world and all the gods of this world who try and enslave us, being caught in a rut, being slaves to the system. Egypt represents living under the grip of sin and us being unable to set ourselves free. For Israel, it would take a supernatural intervention from God to break out from the grip of Egypt and live in freedom. You see, the cross is a promise of God's supernatural power that sets us free from Satan's power over our life. The wilderness speaks about our time here on earth and facing each day and every year, trusting God every day for protection, provision, and holding on to His promise that we would inherit eternal life in the promised land. You see, the promised land is symbolic to you and I of how we can live now and also our life in heaven because of what Jesus accomplished at the cross and resting in the finished work of the cross of Jesus. God promised to deliver His people, but the promise was connected to a sacrifice. You see, the promises of God are connected to the sacrifice that Jesus made at the cross. And it's the sacrifice of Jesus that validates every promise of God. You see, the sacrifice that was needed for the people of Israel to be set free out of Egypt was going to require a perfect lamb, a lamb without defect and no blemish. This is a picture of Jesus. And in Exodus chapter 12, it says, the animal you select must be, one year, must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or goat with no defects. And the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood, smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they eat. And on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. And I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign. Making the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And this plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. The promise was connected 
to the sacrifice of an animal and the blood of the animal. And as God passed over the land, the salvation of the people was dependent on the blood being on the doorpost. God was not looking at the condition of the household or what was happening inside the house. He was looking for the blood on the doorpost so that he could honor his promise of salvation. And it's the same for you and I in our lives, that the promise of God is connected to the blood of Jesus. And when we have the blood of Jesus over our life, it guarantees us that the promise of God is available to us. You see, in Isaiah chapter 9, it speaks about Jesus. It speaks about what Jesus would come and do. It says here, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You know what it's saying is that our world is full of darkness, but Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus, we no longer have to live in darkness. We can live in the light because of Jesus. Look what it goes on and it says, You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. No longer do we have to live in depression. No longer do we have to live in fear, but we can live in joy because the promise is that when Jesus comes, joy will be available for every person who puts their trust in Him. And then it goes on and it says, For, for you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the burden, the heavy burden from their shoulders, and you will break the oppressor's rod. You see, at the cross, Jesus broke the strongholds and lifted the burdens. You see, the promise is that Jesus breaks the yoke of slavery over our life. Being a slave to sin, being a slave to addiction, being a slave to this world system. And you know, in farming terms, two oxen would be joined together by a yoke. And that yoke would make them inseparable. And the oxen are bound together by the yoke. The one was subjected to the other. And wherever the one went, the other one had to go. You see, when sin entered into the world, it attached itself to us, just like a yoke is to an animal. And no matter how hard we try and all of our human efforts, we are unable to break free from this yoke. But the promise is that when Jesus comes, He is the one who breaks the yoke and sets us free so that we are no longer bound by sin, that we can walk in freedom, having the burden lifted from our lives. You see, God promised that Jesus would, number one, come to destroy the plan of the devil. You see, 1 John 3, 8 says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. I want you to know today that 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, and when he came, he didn't just come to mingle around people and heal people. He did all of that, but his main purpose was to destroy the plan of the enemy, and today, his plan over your life has been destroyed in Jesus Christ. This is what Easter is all about. Once and for all, Jesus defeating the works of the enemy so he can no longer have a grip on you and I. Jesus came to destroy the devil's plan for your life of having a relationship with God. And today, maybe you're feeling like you're stuck. Maybe you're feeling like you're trapped in the enemy's plan for your life and you're caught in the cycle of sin or enslaved and you can't break free. I want you to know that Jesus came to destroy that plan over your life. And He came to bring, bring you a better plan. That's why in John 10, 10, Jesus said this, that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. So outside of Jesus and having a relationship with God, there is no life as God defines life and eternal life. In fact, outside of Jesus, life is in vain. Everything life supposedly promises actually steals from you and I, then leads to destruction. And even though it might be appealing and it might sound right and pleasing to the soul, true life and salvation is found in Jesus. And then Jesus goes on and he says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. You need to know today that the cross of Jesus was the pain and suffering of Jesus. And that pain and suffering wasn't done in vain. That pain and suffering was so that you and I could experience God's plan for our life. And no longer do you have to be living and building your life to someone else's plan or to the enemy's plan. You can build your life on God's plan. You see, God's promise to us through Jesus is not just that He would come and break the plan of the devil but that you and I would walk in the perfect plan and the perfect promises of God for our life. You see, the second promise 
that God made a believe around the cross is that it would be a promise of freedom for our lives. You see, a freedom which man could not attain. A freedom we all dream to have an experience. The freedom of life. The freedom of living in light. A freedom to believe and dream again. Freedom from the burden and the weight of sin. Freedom that Jesus came to bring us was the freedom from the burden of sin in our life. You see, as a result of sin entering into this world, it was not just the separation from God, but a whole lot of other challenges humanity would now have to face that would weigh us down, causing us to live in fear, anxiety, and worry. The burden of sickness, the burden of poverty, burden of all the pain and the suffering and the hurt which comes from relationships because of our flawed humanity. And Jesus' promise is that He would come and that He would set us free and lift up those burdens and so that you and I could walk and live in freedom. That's why Isaiah 61, speaking of Jesus, it says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's what the cross is about, is that God doesn't want you live, to live broken. God doesn't want you to go through every day of your life broken by your past. He comes here, he says that he's going to come and heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. You see, our promise of freedom was Jesus' pain. Our fr- promise didn't come cheap. Freedom does not come cheap to you and I. Our freedom cost heaven its only son. It cost heaven its best. Our freedom was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And every moment of pain every nail driven into his hands on that day of Calvary and his feet, every lash upon his back, every piece of suffering, everything that he went through was for you and I to have freedom. And no longer do we have to be locked into a prison of our past, carrying the burden of our bad choices or living in the guilt of our sin because God promised us freedom in Jesus Christ. We can live in freedom today. And the enemy's whole plan for your life is that you would reject salvation so that you could be trapped and caught up in your past. But the promise of the cross is, is a promise of freedom. The next promise that we look find in the cross is this, is that it's the promise of forgiveness of sin. That the cross of Jesus is God's promise to you and I that we would be forgiven of all of our sins. You see, all sin has to be paid for. We cannot escape the fact that sin has to be paid for. And the promise is that Jesus prayed for your sin and for my sin and that the price of sin was paid for at Calvary. You see, there's only one thing that keeps all men from a relationship with God, regardless of where we come from, our social class, our race, no matter the level of your intelligence or the simplicity of our lives. We all have one thing in common which prevents us from having a relationship with God. And that is sin. Sin is the divider. Sin is the thing that separates us all. We cannot erase our sin. Our sin without Jesus. Let me say this. Our sin without Jesus is a yoke attached to our lives. But through Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Through Jesus, hanging on that cross. While he was hanging on that cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them. Forgive them of their sins, for they know not what they are doing. You see, it was in his pain and suffering. In every drop of blood that flowed from his body was the price being paid for our sin. And as Jesus took his last breath on that cross, he shouted, it is finished, saying that the price of sin had been paid once and for all. The debt has been canceled because Jesus paid the price. Look what it goes on and it says in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2 says this, He Himself bore our sins in His body on that cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. It was on the cross of Calvary, friends, that Jesus paid the ultimate price so that you and I would no longer be separated by sin and that you and I could have relationship with God today. And the cross of Calvary is where Jesus hung 
And when he hung on the cross, it was not about heroics. It was not about a display just for the sake of it. It was because Jesus paid the price of our sins. You see, it's not just the promise of freedom. It's not just the promise of forgiveness of sins. It's the promise of salvation. The cross speaks about salvation. John 3, 16, a passage that we all know. It's this, the essence of God's promise for all mankind. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, God's promise is motivated by his love for us. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. You see, every promise of God culminates into this one promise, the promise of salvation. The promise of salvation opens the door to heaven and leads to eternal life with God. You see, God's love for us is motivated by him making a promise to save you and I. You see, when God saved the Israelites out of Egypt, each person had to get their own lamb and ensure that they had the blood of the lamb over their doorpost, over their house. And this speaks about having a personal relationship. It speaks about personally having the blood of the lamb over your house. You see, the blood on the doorpost of your neighbor would not save that person. It was not gonna save them by them knowing that somebody else had the blood. You have to have your own blood. It speaks to you and I about each of us having our own relationship. Each person watching this message today, it's about you and I having a personal relationship with God. You see, my relationship with God cannot save you. Your husband or wife's relationship can't save you. Your family knowing God is not enough for you to be saved. Each person needs a personal relationship with God. You need the blood of Jesus to forgive you and to save you from your own sins. It's not whether your life is perfect. It's not whether you're a church-going person. It's, all about, it's not about the good or the bad that, things that you've done in your life. It's about you having a personal relationship with Jesus, with God, through the blood of Jesus. It's about your name, church. It's about your name being written in the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? Because when you come to Jesus and you receive His grace and His mercy and make Him your Lord and Savior, all your sins are forgiven. And God opens the book of life, which is in heaven, and He writes your name in that book. And if your name is in that book, if your name is in the book of life, you have eternal life. That means that when you die, you go to heaven and you're saved from hell. That the promise is eternal life. It's not what you've done on earth. It's not all the good things and the deeds and the works that gets your name into the book of life. It's only through Jesus Christ being your Lord and your Savior that your name is written into the book of life. You see, the promise of God is more than just words. It's more than just words that God speaks. You see, every word that God speaks comes to pass. We see this in Genesis chapter one, when God said, let there be light, there was light. And when God said, I'm gonna send a savior and he would be rejected by many, but he would die for those who would receive him. And for those who receive him would re receive eternal life. You see, the promise of God is a person and his name is Jesus. The promise is Jesus, who is the beginning and the end of God's salvation plan for humanity. You see, believing in the name of Jesus and receiving Jesus means that you inherit the greatest gift of all time, and that is eternal life. Because there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4 says this, salvation is found in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's only through Jesus, church. You can't buy your salvation. You can't work for it. You have to receive it. And this is why Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. And see, and by believing and receiving Jesus and receiving Him as your Lord and Savior, all of the other promises that God has made become yours. Freedom, forgiveness, 
salvation, healing, peace, blessing on this earth. And today this promise is for you. It's available for you today. All this promise is to be your promise. And allow this promise to become part of your life. You see, right in the dying moments when Jesus was on the cross, he hung there and next to him were two other men hanging on either side of him. And as Jesus hung there, salvation was available to them. The promise of forgiveness, the promise of eternal life, the promise of freedom in eternity. And these two men speak to you and me today. You see, the one man, as he hung on the cross next to Jesus, he scoffed at him, he mocked him, And he rejected God's plan of salvation. You know what he was saying? I don't need forgiveness for my sins and the life that I've lived. I'm my own man. I don't need God. But the man on the other side, he cried out to Jesus. And he said, please, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom today. I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy and your grace for the life that I've lived. Please forgive me. I've made mistakes. I know that I have not lived right. He acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. And in Jesus' dying moments, He promised Him that today you will be with me in paradise. That man was saved in a moment. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. One moment when you decide that Jesus is God's promise, that Jesus is the Savior. And you make a decision to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I call on you today. I call on every person listening to this message today not to be like the one who laughed and scoffed and rejected the love of God, but be the person who calls out to Jesus and says, Jesus, I ask you for forgiveness. I I ask you for grace and mercy, and I receive it today. You see, the truth is this, is that every one of us have to pay for the price of our sins. And we have one of two options with our life. We can either receive God's salvation and allow Jesus to pay for the price of our sin. Or we can decide that we are gonna pay for our sins. And the result of you paying for your sin is eternal separation. But God's love calls on you and I today. Calls and reaches out to us And says, no matter what it's been through, no matter what you've done, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the promise. That Jesus is the Son of God who came to save you and I so that you and I can be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life with God. If that's you today, maybe you've never made a decision. Maybe somebody invited you to hear this message. Maybe you're not even aware of the story of humanity. It really doesn't matter what you know or what you don't know. What's important for you today is to know that your name is written in the book of life. It's important for you to know today that Jesus is the only one who can forgive you of your sins. And He does it with a loving heart. That's why He died on the cross. So that you and I could experience eternal life and God's forgiveness and freedom from our sins. Maybe today you want to make that decision. Maybe it's the first time you want to make this decision. You've never made this decision with your life before. I want to say a prayer with you. Today you could be invited to watch the sermon online. Maybe you used to be a part of following God and serving God. But over the year that's happened and things that have happened in your life, you find yourself disconnected from God. And today you say, God, I want to come back. Easter means something special to me. And today I want to recommit my life to you. I want to say this prayer with you as well. And so right where you are, whether you're making a first time decision or a recommitment, I want you to believe these words as I pray this prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you today that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross just as you promised. That all of your promises are true. And the promise of salvation through Jesus is mine today. The promise of forgiveness of all my sins today, I receive that promise. I receive the promise of eternal life and salvation in you. And I receive your plan for my life. And today I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my past. And I ask you to become my Lord and Savior. 
And from this day onwards, I commit my life to you and I put my hope and I put my trust in you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me God's plan for my life. And from today onwards, I follow after you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, if you made a decision today, maybe that's your first time you've ever said this prayer. We want to congratulate you and tell you it's the greatest decision that you could ever make with your life. We know God's got a great plan, a great future for your life. If you recommitted your life back to God today, we want to tell you this is an incredible day for you as all of heaven rejoices with you. We want to say that if you made the decision, we'd love to connect with you. And on your screen, there's going to come up an icon that says, I have decided Just click on that. Let us know that you've made a decision to follow Jesus today. And we want to connect with you and want to encourage you to take your next step with God. And as you made this decision, you can sign up for Discover Faith, which is going to get you connected to your faith in Christ Jesus and help you and teach you about what it means to be a Christ follower and the decision that you've made today. Church, what an incredible day, Easter Friday, the day that Jesus died for you and I. As we go out today, I want to encourage you that tomorrow we're going to have our first Saturday prayer meeting. So I want to invite you to join us, be a part of what God is doing in this season of our lives. And don't forget that Sunday was Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God bless you and have an incredible day.